Welcome to our podcast. This is Friends on Fire. I'm Mike. I'm a lifelong devotee of financial independence. I even wrote a book about it. And I'm Maggie, a newer convert, but just as passionate, especially on the intersection of minimalism and financial independence. We're one in the same. We are two like-minded friends who believe that talking about money with your friends and family opens the door to financial well-being. The Friends on Fire podcast is about dispelling myths, building financial acumen, and sharing your financial independence journey with the people you care about. This is Friends on Fire. Hey, Maggie. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mia. Hey, Maggie. Hey, Mia. Hey, Mike. So that's Mia, our college intern. We are on our second round of college specials tonight, and we're going to be doing some some Q&A. So this, is, this has been fun. As a reminder, we did an episode number 25 on how to approach college decisions, but it was more of a financial and life strategy perspective. And our episode last week was about our top 10 tips for how to save money. And this one's going to be a little bit different. Yeah. So this one, we had Mia ask a bunch of her friends on social media what some of their biggest personal finance questions were. And so many of them called in and left us voicemails. And so we are going to do our best to answer their burning financial questions. And I'm interested to see if any of these questions are different than you and I would have had 15, 20 years ago. So let's uh, let's start playing them. Sure. I'm just excited to get voicemails from somebody other than my mom. So we're moving on up. This is my question for the college episode. Um, How do I start investing in stocks? All right. So how do you start investing in stocks? That's a great question. I wish I had done this earlier. I wish someone had explained this to me when I was in college. Well, I think the first thing you have to understand is that investing in the stock market comes with quite a bit of risk. The good news is when you are in college or fresh out of college, you have very little money which which you can risk in the market. So it's actually kind of an ideal time to start teaching yourself how the market works. If you wait 20 years after college and then start investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in as your first foray into this, you can lose a ton of money. First thing you need to do is technically you need to open up a brokerage account. So Schwab, Fidelity, E-Trade, Vanguard, Vanguard. Any, any of these Jinx. companies. <laughs> Jinx. Thank you for jumping in with just one example as I listed five of them. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just handle this one. Vanguard. I'm just going to keep saying Vanguard every few minutes. It's going to be a long episode. So open up one of these accounts, deposit some money into it, and then you need to start doing research. And hopefully you will be well practiced in doing research after spending quite a few years in college. But it's hard for me to distill some kind of simplified, punchy advice. Once you get your money into this account, you need to pick something to buy. And the easiest thing you can do is buy an exchange traded fund, an ETF that invests in a bunch of different companies across the entire stock market or a particular sector. Um, try to avoid picking companies that you just know very well, like you shop at, what's a store that you shop at all the time, Mia? Target. Target. So don't just say, I'm going to invest in Target because I go there and I like all their deals or I really like their clothes or whatever. That's not how you evaluate an investment. And so try to pick something that has some risk, but not too much risk. Uh, Again, doing an ETF is probably the easiest thing that you can do. And an ETF is an exchange traded fund. I'm not sure if you said that. I did say that. Oops. I'm just going to reinforce a couple of things because we're very different types of investors, uh, Mike and myself. I agree with Mike saying like, do not buy individual stocks. There's just really not a reason you need to be at that age. It's not, it's too risky. It's not really worth it. Buy stocks and funds that mimic the S&P 500, right? And that, and, and or if there's a certain category of things that you're really passionate about, like energy funds or something like that, Definitely. Yeah. You could look for college kids are passionate about well, the you know, energy sector. You could have people that are studying certain areas and like people are studying clean energy or something like that. If there's something you're okay, passionate about and you're invested in, like go for it. Buy an ETF um, that is in that space. 
Um, but in general, buying some really basic funds like a v- VTSAX or something like that, which is a Vanguard fund, but something like that that is, will, there is just, you know, decades of history that it will perform well over time and it will outperform any individual picks that you could make no matter how much research you do. So keep it simple. Don't overthink it. And invest early and invest often, right? If you get an allowance from your parents, find some ways to spend a little bit less and like start putting some of that money in the stock market or tell your parents that you want to start putting some money in the stock market. They might be so proud of you for saying that, that they'll give you some money to start putting in. Yeah. And on that point, your parents might be much better at this than you are. And so they'll probably want to help you and help you make decisions and teach you what they know. So leverage your parents if, if they are already investing. Yeah. But on that, on that note, Mike, be careful because some of your parents may not be smarter than you are on this because many people are not making great decisions in this area. So if your parents are like giving you random stock tips and they're not a professional stockbroker, you might want to question it and just kind of keep it simple with some exchange traded funds that follow the general market. Yeah. All right. That was a hard, hard question to unpack. Let's, let's move on. Is there something easier we can move on to? Uh, let's see. I'm just doing these in order. Oh, here's a good one. Hi, this is my question for the college episode. Um, which credit card should I pick for my first card and what are some tips on how to manage it? Ooh, I like this one. Yeah. So which credit card and what are some tips on how to manage it? If you already have a credit history, so if you have been on your parents' credit card for a number of years and you have a a high credit score, like if your credit score is over 700 or approaching 800 um, because of your parents' history, then you can go get any credit card you want. I, I don't think it... I don't think there is one that is better for young people versus old people. Um, So go get a card that gives you airline miles for the airline you like to fly or the hotel you like to stay in. But that being said, most people are not going to have a strong enough credit history in college or coming out of college to go get any credit card they want. And so you would want to apply for any one of the, you know, college branded cards. So all of the banks have um, you know, like a college version of their card, which is going to have like no fee and basically it's just like a normal card. There's really no difference between any of these cards. So whatever card you can actually go get accepted for is the card you should get. Hey, Mike, that's interesting. So you think the average college student that doesn't have a large credit history would not qualify for like the Amazon Visa card or some of the travel cards? Well, if you don't, if you don't have a credit score, you wouldn't get it. If you have a short credit history, you wouldn't have a high enough number that even you would get approved for that. I don't exactly know what the threshold is for getting approved by certain cards. I, they you know, keep that kind of secret. But check your credit score. If it's in the if it's in the sixes, you can probably go get the Amazon card. If it's in the sevens, you can probably go get, you know, a travel card. It's 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 tough for me to say. Can you um, apply with your parents? So if you didn't have as good of a credit score, can you, if one of them is willing to apply and then let you have a card on their account that basically is now your account that they're not using, but you're using? Feels like a good good question. I don't know. Well, you said you put some of your kids on your account. So I, I know you can do that and they'll match your credit basically. Yeah. But I think what you're asking is, can you have your parent co-sign your card? No, I was more saying if you don't yet have good credit, your parent, it's kind of like co-signing, but it's different. But could your parents just open the card for you and then put a card in your name on the account? So basically it's their account. You have a card on it, but they're not using the account. It's really just your account. Yeah. That's kind of risky for a parent though, because they would. Well, yeah, they're on the hook. I mean, I would, I I would never open up a a line of credit and not check it all of the time. And I, I think that kind of defeats the purpose of it. Right? Well, no, I agree. I'm not saying don't check it, but like I'd open up a credit card for one of my college age kids and I'd trust them and I'd look at the balance and I'd see what they're putting on it. And I'd make sure they could afford to pay it off. Talk to your no? parents. You seem stunned by this suggestion. I, I'm not sure. Mia, that that... do you have a credit card? Yes, but I don't know enough about how it works to answer any more questions. <laughs> Did you, but is it like your own? <laughs> I love, I love the honesty. 
it, did you apply for it yourself or did like your parents hand it to you and say this is your credit no, card? No, my parents handed it. Okay, to so me. her parents likely added her as a user on one of their accounts. Right. Do you do you pay the bill yourself, Mia? No. It's just for oh, emergency. Yeah. Oh, it's for Okay, that's different. Yeah. This is what I would recommend. This is what I did. I think I had like a bank account and a debit card in college and then my parents' credit card which I could use and pay them back on. And you know that my dad and I kept track of this stuff down to the penny, so this was not an issue. But yeah, I would think you either open up your own college credit card and just do it yourself if you have low credit, or just have your parents open up a card on their account and give you one, and you, ju you just have to work out how you manage it together. Yeah, but I, I would encourage college students to start the kind of quote, you know, a light version of, credit card hacking in college to say, you spend a lot of money on random things, put as much of that as you can on a credit card where you're earning some sort of an interesting benefit like Amazon points or like Sky Miles or whatever it might be. And then be responsible and don't charge things you can't afford and pay off your credit card every month because that's what credit cards are meant for. They are not meant for you to put things on them that you can't afford that you then need to pay off over time. Because, again, that's just something that we certainly do not encourage. If you are in a situation where you have something you have to buy, or you have an issue with your car, or you are just in a situation where you're very financially insecure and you have no choice but to put things on a credit card that you won't be able to pay the full amount on every month, I would highly encourage you to research and find 0% credit card opportunities because they do still exist and you can get credit cards that will give you 0% interest for a year. Again, your credit has to be strong enough to get that, but there are still cards that do that as an introductory offer and you can find those offers and, and research that on websites like, I feel like you're going to complete my sentence, Mike. No, I feel like I'm going to contradict your answer. Oh no, what's your contradiction? If you decide to get a credit card, you should always be in the mindset of paying it off every single month. Like you need to treat it as cash. It is just like a simpler way of not having to carry cash. But there's probably some emergency cases where you need to put stuff on a card that you, you can't afford. But the, the, the answer of how to manage it is to be disciplined and be yeah. honest with yourself. Yeah, like Starbucks is not an emergency, right? Yes, you not being able to afford food to eat for the month, that's an emergency. You not being able to pay your electrics, electricity bill, that might be an emergency. You not having money to go out with your friends this weekend, not an emergency. Not right, something that is not an emergency. <laughs> might feel like an emergency. I, I can relate to it feeling like an emergency, but it is not an emergency. And you've got to be conscious and responsible and disciplined of, again, you might hit something where you're all of a sudden like, well, this is an emergency, but you blew all your money in the month prior to that, right? So don't let it get to the point where you sort of are excusing things as emergencies because you can't pay your bills at the end of the month. But all month leading up to that, you were going out, you were going to Starbucks, you were spending money on things that you did not need and that you had other options for. I always use Starbucks as my example. I don't actually always mean Starbucks. I just mean superfluous crap that you don't need and that you could be very happy living without and find other ways to uh, live without them. Yeah. But you also hate Starbucks. <laughs> Mike, I think we should just wrap the question on credit cards up with one final tip, which is there are some really good websites, nerdwallet.com being one of the best and, and certainly most well-known that help you to compare and research different credit card options. So that's also a great resource as you're thinking about getting a first credit card. Yeah. And as we've discussed in previous episodes, uh, you were approached by numerous people offering you credit cards in college. So chances are there's going to be, you know, Visa and American Express and MasterCard people walking around with applications, right? Yeah. Except Mia told me that doesn't happen anymore in college campuses. I think they now have like predatory marketing uh, rules and practices in place that stop some of that that didn't exist back in the olden days before digital cameras. So, in addition to some of the call-in questions, we also got some text messages over social media 
of different questions. And one of our favorite ones, we just wanted to give a shout out and honorable mention to real quick. I don't know if we have time to cover it on this episode, but Mike, you want to read it? The question is simply explain taxes to me. All right. Well, taxes is kind of complicated. This is a, this is a meaty question for a college kid. We might need a whole episode for this one. All right, so taxes. Do your like Mike's on the minute version of explaining taxes. Mike's minute on the mic? Minute on the mic. What did I just say? Mike on the minute. Taxes is what the government takes out of your income to pay for social services like, you know, trash and streets and police and the military and government and all that sort of stuff. And so you pay taxes based on your income. Uh, you also pay taxes based on your spending and a sales tax. But primarily, I think this question is around income tax, right? Are well, you, I don't know, Mike. Question? I mean, I, I just have a, I have a more succinct definition for taxes. Uh, this will be a first if you have a more <laughs> succinct definition. I mean, All right, I, let's hear it. Just, when I first heard that question, I immediately thought to myself, oh, taxes are involuntary fees levied on individuals or corporations and enforced by a government entity whether local, regional, or national, in order to finance government activities. That's what that's, I, I mean, that's just what came to my mind. That, you definitely read that off the internet. I didn't just Google that, but that is the definition of taxes according to Investopedia. Carry on, carry on. All right, so income taxes is a percentage of the income you earn that's paid to local, state, and federal entities. And so as your income goes up, we have what's called a marginal tax rate system. And so on your first bit of income, you're going to pay a certain percent, let's say 10%. And then as you go up in income, the next block is going to be taxed at a slightly higher percent, 12%. And then you keep going up. And so if you are a very, very high earner earning half a million dollars, you're going to be paying into the 30% range. And these things change every year. But uh, the more you earn, the more you're going to pay in taxes. But it's kind of unavoidable. And the only thing you can do is make sure that you're taking advantage of kind of investment strategies and retirement accounts to reduce the amount of taxes you owe. But you do have to pay them. Don't, don't uh, skip out on them because you'll be arrested. Well done on explaining taxes to me, which was uh, our favorite submission. Okay, next question. Here we go. Hey, this is Katrine. I have a question for the college episode. What are um, your tips for how to start saving early? So Katrine, great question. One thing that is worth referencing is our last episode was 10 ideas for how to save money while in college. So I'd go back and listen to that because that would give a lot of really helpful tips and tricks. And if you follow a lot of that advice, then you'll have savings. And the idea is actually take those savings and put them away and do something with them, right? So we just talked about investing earlier on this episode, but you want to put it away and get it out of your hands so that it's not just sitting there in your checking account because it's too easy for you to spend. So, you know, our, our biggest tips I think are around being very conscious about how much money you're spending and being, you know, we made the joke in the last episode about living in, I don't remember the term you used, but a dump, living in a dump. Uh, but you know, you don't need to live in the fanciest place on campus, right? Or off campus. Um, and so really controlling and minimizing your expenses so that you can save money and then do something smart with that money you're saving, like start to invest it in ETF funds. One of the things that I see people getting into the most trouble with is immediately after college, as soon as you have a paycheck and you have free time and you are working with people who are earning considerably more money than you, the pressures of lifestyle inflation hit you very hard. And so the best thing you can do to save money is just try to keep your lifestyle as flat as possible coming out of college and avoid all of the immediate urges to dress like your coworkers, drive cars like your coworkers, live in certain places. Because if you start down that path, you will spend all of your money that you earn for the rest of your life. 
And so just be very mindful in that first year of getting a paycheck to keep your expenses under control. And Mike, you use the word mindful, which I think is a really important word and something we talk about a lot. But on episode 23, we talked about, uh, the title was Happiness, Sex, and Money. But we talked a lot about what truly makes you happy. And I think, you know, the earlier you realize that spending large amounts of money and having really fancy things and, and more stuff than you truly need doesn't make you happy, the sooner and earlier you realize that in life, the better your financial situation will be because you won't be susceptible to all the things that we talk, that Mike was just talking about around FOMO and feeling like you've got to kind of keep up with the Joneses and constantly inflating your lifestyle um, based on those around you and based on you having, you know, a little bit more money in your pocket. So I think, I think that is one of the biggest things you can do is realize what truly makes you happy and coming to the realization that it actually doesn't cost a lot of money to be happy is one of the biggest ways that you'll be able to reduce your expenses and save more for the future and then have so much more time, right? Like had everybody that we talk about, particularly in the fire space, Mike, constantly is saying they wish they had started earlier and that the earlier you realize some of these things, the better off you will be in the long term and the more financial freedom you'll have earlier in life. So I think, you know, that's one of the the biggest things is just kind of the mindset and realizing what makes you happy. So I mentioned episode 23 on happiness and money. And then another good episode for some inspiration in that category is episode 35, which is called 10 Fire Extinguishers and How to Avoid Them. Because there we talk a lot about FOMO and keeping up with the Joneses and lifestyle inflation and all of these things to avoid because those are the things that start to drain your money over time and early on and kind of get worse as you get older. And I will add one more episode to the list, number 39, Adulting and Money. So this was a request by a, a younger listener Recent who's only a few grad. years out of, out of college. And so we covered a lot of advice on, you know, how to become an adult and manage your money like one. Exactly. That's a great, great one. All right. Do we have any more questions? We have one more question, but I got a quick question for Mia. I'm curious if in your friend groups at college and in the people that you hang out with. Is there a lot of pressure for financial stuff and things that cost a lot of money? Like, do you guys talk about money a lot? I wouldn't say we talk about money a lot, but there's definitely pressure to go out often, like with your friends. And it's sad when you don't have the extra money to spend to like go out for like a weekend if you have to do something else with that money. Yeah, that's interesting. If if you were to suggest to your friends like, hey, what if instead of going out, we just cook at home this weekend and, Play you know, Uno. Go, go, <laughs> like, what, would they look at you like you had a third eye or would, would that be well received by some people? I think it'd be well received every once in a while. <laughs> that's, that's fair. That, that's yeah. the same thing as adults. You know, you don't want to do it all the time. Yeah. They are not in college to stay home and cook dinner, Maggie. What are you I know. I'm sorry. Thinking. I'm kind of lame. Okay. Last question. Hi, this is Anna, and I have a question for y'all for your college episode. I was wondering, is is Roth IRA something I need to look into as a college student? I would love to know. Thank you so much. Bye. That's a great question, Anna. I'm going to let Mike take this one. Yeah, I like Anna. She's my favorite so far. So yes, you should be looking into Roths and you can open up a Roth at any age that you are earning money and paying taxes on it. So a Roth IRA is a retirement account, but it's a post-tax account. So a 401k is a pre-tax account. So you put money in before taxes are taken out. So you don't pay taxes on it. And then in the future, you pay taxes when you retire. A Roth, you pay taxes now you put the money into the account and then it grows tax-free for the rest of your life and then you take it out of retirement. A Roth is extremely beneficial. You could have something in there for 40 or 50 years and growing to millions of dollars and then when you take it out, you never pay taxes on it. For someone who is going to be early in their earning career or even in college where they're earning just very little and perhaps paying no taxes at all, this is the best time to be making a Roth contribution. Because if you take, let's say, $10,000 in your working life and then you 
take it in your paycheck, you get $6,000 out of it after tax. That's what you put into your Roth. That's the limit. But when you're a college student and you're earning very little and not paying any taxes, you could take $6,000 of income. You won't pay any taxes on that whatsoever. You put it into this account and it grows tax-free. You never pay taxes on it again. So there's a huge opportunity for you to save money into this Roth vehicle that will benefit you greatly in retirement. Yeah, I think Roth is in the same category as the stock and investing question of just the the same theme around the earlier you start it, the better. Um, and I used to, my my parents would not have been able to afford this when I was in college, but these are the sort of deals I would make with my kids. So as a college student, if you think your parents can swing this, I always think it's fun to like propose different financial schemes for things to your parents. I used to do this uh, within the confines of what they could afford. I'd be like, how about if I do this, then you give me this. But I would say something, you know, if you want to negotiate with your parents, be like, look, if I keep up my scholarship and get good grades and, you know, do X, Y, Z, whatever's important to them and important to you, will you help me, you know, invest in a Roth IRA and to the, you know, up to the maximum every year? And, you know, there could be things like that where you actually propose things like that to your parents. And again, if they're in a financial position to be able to afford that, they may not even think that that's something, they may not even realize that's something beneficial they could do for you. So if you're proactive enough to suggest that to them, they might say, yeah, right. You keep up your, you know, uh, grades well enough to keep whatever state scholarship you might be on or something like that, which we have a lot of those in the state of Georgia, that they would be willing to um, fund something like that. If my kids came to me with a proposal like that, and again, they were on the scholarships that the state of Georgia offers for in-state tuition, and they were keeping their grades up to keep those scholarships, I'd be like, yeah, actually, that's great. I, I love the... Uh, I love the proactiveness and the cleverness of making a pitch like that. And I might, you know, I might make them, you know, I might negotiate with them a little bit, but can't hurt to ask. I'll put it that way. That is a great idea. Definitely ask your parents for money. One thing, though, to clarify, the contributions to your Roth cannot exceed your income for the year. So if you want to make a $6,000 contribution to a Roth, you need to have earned $6,000 and paid taxes on it. Uh, or at least great, have it be great point. I actually did income. not realize that. It's a great, great point. But you can go earn $6,000 doing a part-time job, no problem. Okay, that is it for our questions. Any, Mia, you got any other burning questions you want to ask us while you have us here? Nope. <laughs> 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 Short and sweet. She's a pro by now. I'll give a I'll give a shout out to Mia. Thank you for preparing both of these episodes during our college week. We hope these were helpful and thought provoking discussions and thoughts and tips for college students. And I think the most important thing is ask questions of your friends, of your parents do research. It is good to be exploring these things and learning about money from an early age, because as we've been talking about, the earlier you start doing any of these things, whether it's starting to be disciplined or starting to invest or start to save, the earlier earlier you do it, the better off you're going to be for the rest of your life. Exactly. And Google is your friend. When you don't know, know something, just go Google it. You'll find a ton of great information. You'll find lots of podcasts like this one and many others that you can learn a ton from. So there's just take advantage of all of the different opportunities that are around you and easily available to you for free. Thank you all for listening. Again, if you have been challenged or inspired by whatever you have heard here today, please rate and review this show. And you can also subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode. If you have any thoughts or questions, we'd love to hear from you. And you can leave us a voicemail or text us at 404-981-3370 or hit us up on Instagram or Facebook. Awesome. I think our, our final thought for our college students out there would be, I hope you get to have a somewhat normal college experience this year. I know last year was uh, heavily interrupted by COVID and a lot of schools shut down and started meeting virtually. So I'm sure you guys all miss your friends and miss all the fun social aspects of college. So I hope for all of our sakes, things get back to normal as soon as possible. And in the meantime, be safe, wear a mask, don't get pregnant. (laughs) It's going to be the advice I give my kids every day. Just don't get pregnant. Right. I think that's just general good advice. (laughs) 
Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Mia. Thanks, Mia. Bye. Bye. Bye.